Welcome to Bethlehem Church Online. I'm Pastor Matt. I'm so excited that you decided to join us for worship today. I hope the singing and preaching of God's Word is uplifting and it gives you just what you need. I'm not sure where you are in your relationship or your walk with the Lord, uh, but I want today to be a blessing. I want you to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that today is encouraging and that it's just what you need. If it's your first time, make sure to click the link in the post and fill out that form. We have a free gift for you following today's service. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the service. Well, let's go to the Word. We have a whole passage to read. Um, it was funny, Cody and I were, were joking this week. He's like, are they still in the upper room? Like, you, you've, this is like the upper room, today is part seven. Are they literally still in there for this many chapters? And I was like, I think so, I don't know. Uh, but at the end of chapter 14, it says, let us get up and go, you know. Um, but this whole passage, really 14, you know, John 14, which there's, think about all the amazing, um, I hate to do this, if there's, uh, can I get, a, yeah, just a, a bottle of water, a cup, I'm dry this morning, I don't think I'm gonna make it through, but, um, or even a cough drop, that'd be fine too, um, when, um, when you think about John 14, right, I'm the way, the truth, the life, oh, sweet, just chuck it at me, thanks, James, you the man, sweet, Ricola, love that, so, <laughs> oh, man, I'm pretty sidetracked today, it's going to be a fun one, just so you know, buckle up, um, think about all the, like, one-liners in John 14, right, in my father's house are many mansions, if you're reading KJV still. I still read both. <laughs> if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, it's better that I go away because I'm sending the comforter, the counselor, the way, the truth, the life. So many things are happening in John 14. We, we get so many amazing encouragements from, from, from this book, right? And all this is the upper room conversation. And I dug a little bit deeper into it. And some people think they never left the upper room. Some people think they stayed there all the way to chapter 18. And him saying, let us go away, it's, it's a more of a figurative thing because he's been engaging on this level of saying, I'm going to what? I'm going to go away, right? And so it's kind of like it could be a play on words. Um, so some people think that all three of these chapters are there in the upper room. I think personally at some point, Maybe John 14, the end of it, he, d he does get up, and they start walking. They go across the Kidron Valley, uh, and then they head to the Garden of Gethsemane, um, where they pray and engage in that spiritual warfare where Jesus is betrayed. Um, but either way, whether you think they're still in the upper room, which some people do, or they're walking and talking, right? It could be, right, they, they get up and they leave the upper room after this preparatory uh, Passover meal, whether we think it's the Wednesday, the day before, or the Thursday. Thank you, Mr. Pete. Um, you know, wherever you land on that, thank you so much. Um, it could be that, that they are still there, but it could be that they got up and they're walking and he's saying, hey, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And he might look over in reference to, you know, a vineyard that's right there as they're walking to the Kidron Valley. I'm not sure how it's all playing out, right? But either way, whether they're in the upper room still or walking through to the Garden of Gethsemane, this is one continuous conversation. Everybody agrees on that. And, and so whether they're seated or, or walking, the things that Jesus is sharing are unbelievable. And, and I don't know about you, but I've been so encouraged by, by his words and by this passage and, and how it all fits mm -hmm. together. And as we approach, this is chapter 17, Jesus begins to pray. Uh, and, and let me ask you this question. How many want Jesus to pray over them today? Anybody? Somebody want that? Doesn't that sound amazing? Just having Jesus pray over you, having him like just go before you in prayer, knowing that he knows who is at the right hand, him, right? But knowing, I, I was meaning to say, knowing that he knows the Father sitting in the throne room, as he could just literally on our behalf go to the Father for us and pray over us. 
Well, even as he's describing that in John 14, and he's telling his disciples that he's going to go away, they didn't quite understand it, but he gets to this place in chapter 17 where he just begins to pray. He prays for himself, and he prays for them, his followers. And it's just like this beautiful uh, ending, really, to this conversation. And if you want to look for, you know, if you're Googling it or diving deeper or studying, studying it more, the upper room discourse is, is, you know, a lot of people, like I said, whether they're in the room or not, they definitely put these chapters together and call the whole thing his upper room discourse. And as he reaches the end of it, he prays over them. What a special thing to experience as either they're walking or they're in the room and Jesus begins to pray over them. So that's what this chapter is. So let's read it together, John chapter 17. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Since you gave him authority over all people, that he may give eternal life to what? You have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. That is so rich. Don't miss it. I'm going to go ahead and apologize right now for all this. <laughs> you guys love it when I get a cough drop, don't you? It's James's fault. <laughs> Think about how, I'm going to, I have to read this again. Think about how rich this is. Look, the, the Bible is, it's so right there. It's, it's there for all of us. I'm not that smart. I'm really not. I just feel called of the Lord to lead his church in his word. And don't miss the simplicity of this and the greatness of it and the impact that this could have in your life. I'm going to read this again. This is eternal life, that they may know you. Who's he talking to? The who. Look at verse number one. We'll go back. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, what's the next word? Father, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Who's the Son? That's who? Jesus. So that the Son may glorify you. Who's the you? The Father. Since you gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. The Father gave authority to Jesus so that Jesus could administer eternal life. And then he says, this is eternal life, that they may know who? You, the Father. Jesus is speaking. The only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ himself. I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father... Glorify me in your presence that the glory I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. Because I have given them the words you gave me, they have received them and have known uh, for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. And if you've been with me on this journey through John, you know how pivotal that is, that conversion piece. They've believed, right? Verse 9, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are who? Yours. Don't you want to be prayed over by Jesus this morning? Anybody want Jesus to pray over them? Does anyone belong to the Father this morning? Has anyone committed your life to the Father and say, I want to be in your family? I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be an orphan anymore. Lord Jesus, I don't want to wander. I don't want to be lost in a world uh, of just anti-purpose. I want to have your purpose. I want to be yours. I want to give my life to you. And then Jesus recognizes that belief and that commitment. And he says, do you see, Father, that they are yours? And they've committed to you because of me and because of what I've done. Do you see how this works? I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. Everything I have is what? Is yours. Everything you have is mine, 
and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. There's just something special about Jesus' prayers, isn't there? My goodness. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas. Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my what? Joy completed in them. Man, you got to sit on that for a minute. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but watch this, but that you protect them from the evil one. That's powerful. That's powerful. I'm not praying that they come out of their difficulty. Why do, what, how do you know he's talking about difficulty and struggle? Remember John 16, 33? I told you it's like one of my favorite verses in the Bible. In the world, you're going to have what? Tribulation. Trouble. But in me, you will have what? Peace. And as Jesus prays over them, he says to them, hey, I'm not, I'm not praying that you take them out of the trouble. I'm praying you protect them. Son, that's good. Watch this. Sanctify them by the what? Truth. Your word is what? Truth. As you, somebody's upset. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Let, let me, let's read that again, right? I pray not only for, for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Not only am I praying for you, disciples, but I'm praying for all the future what? Does anybody want to be prayed over by Jesus? He's already prayed over you. Hmm. Did you know that? Did you know that you're sitting here this morning and he knew you? He knew you by name. He knows how many hairs are on your head. Some of you, that's easier than others. (laughs) But he has prayed for you and prayed over you. My goodness gracious. Verse 21, may they all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, you are in me, I am the vine, you are the branches, so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know you have sent me. And have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. So that they will see my glory which you have given me. Because you have loved me before the foundations of the world. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you. And they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them. And will continue to make it known. So that the love you have loved me with may be in them. And I may be in them. Somebody say amen. Mm. there's something about the Lord Jesus' prayer. Amen. I just love to see it. Here's some thoughts here. And, and I look, we could spend a month on this passage, but we're not going to. We're going to keep moving. Um, we're going to knock it out today. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of perspective on it, okay? Uh, a little bit of thoughts here, and then some of the high points that stuck out to me. As Jesus began to pray, he spoke first of himself. The focus of Jesus' request, however, was that his Father would be glorified. These few sentences are packed with profound truths. And this is an excerpt from the commentary, and it's sourced there in in the notes. Here's the profound truths. These are the things that, uh, this is very concise, I love the way they put it, but these are the things that you need to cling to. You know, it's like, we read the Bible sometimes. How many, well, let me just ask this. How many read the Bible and feel like you don't get anything out of it? Anybody? Okay, nobody's going to admit to that publicly, I guess. 
I mean, people say it to me all the time. Man, I feel like I didn't get anything out of my Bible. So, but I, I guess that's one-on-one conversation. What, what am I thinking? Getting you to in, admit to the whole church that you don't get anything out of Scripture. <laughs> Anybody ever read their Bible and not get anything? I, look, I'll be the first to raise my hand and say, yeah, sometimes it's just like you just glaze over, you know. But I think sometimes we miss what's right there in plain sight, the eternal truths of the Word of God. They're there, and they're simple, and they're, and they're right in front. So in this, it, it, you know, this commentary kind of lays it out. He says, look, here's the profound truth. Jesus has authority over all people to give eternal life. That's a really important truth. And, and I may ask you, hey, do you know that Jesus holds the keys to eternal life? Do you know that? And you may say, yeah, yeah, I know that. That sounds right. Yeah, sure. But the reason why we know that Jesus is the one who gives eternal life is because the Bible says so. It's the same thing that the Holy Spirit is not going to tell you to do something that doesn't align with what Jesus wants you to do. And therefore, Jesus isn't going to tell you to do something through the power of the Holy Spirit if the Word of God doesn't declare it so. Jesus didn't get out of pocket. He, he followed what the Father's plan was for his life. And the Father accepted what Jesus did as an eternal work and then gave him control of eternity, crazy, death, hell, and the grave because he conquered it. And the Holy Spirit is the one sealing us all under the day of redemption, as Paul said in the book of Ephesians. He's the one keeping you. Jesus delegated that to him. And they did so in this beautiful way, right? That's, that's how it works. So we, we see how these things work. Well, Scripture's working the same way. It's telling us, and what it tells us is, is the truth. And the truth is what makes us what? Free, right? It's, it's so simple. It's right there before us, but the Word of God holds the answer. But many times we don't submit to the Word of God. Many times we read in the Word of God and it says this, do this thing, and we go, oh, I can't do that. Well, why can't you? Because I just can't. Because then it would have this effect. Well, wouldn't that be what God wants you to do, that effect? Wouldn't that be called God's what? Will? Hmm. Anyway. Just a little, I guess, logic. I I guess that's what this is. Jesus has authority over all people to give eternal life. Watch this. The essence of eternal life is knowing the Father. Did you see that when we read it? It's knowing the Father. We'll come back to some of these things. Jesus had been sent to the earth to complete his Father's work. Here's another one. Jesus existed in glory with the Father before creation. Another thing stated in his prayer. As Jesus was about to finish his work on earth, he asked to be glorified and thereby bring glory and honor to the Father. Now, here's my words. If God the Father would glorify the Son in his life, death, and resurrection then Jesus in turn could glorify the Father in reuniting all that belonged to the Father in the eternal afterlife. The global church is the consummation of this plan. The gospel will reveal itself in a gathering of peoples that are uniquely diverse but have their connections in the, cro- in the cross of Jesus. Excuse me. Now, uh, you say, well, what does diversity have to do with it? Well, in this context, it has everything to do with it. Because he prays what? He prays forward. He prays for them, most of them exclusively Jewish, right? And then he says, I also pray for all of those who will know from you. But we have the New Testament. How many are thankful that we're living 2,000 years after all this happened and we kind of know what happens? Like, I'm thankful for that. I'm like, man, I'm really glad that I'm born now and not then. Because they were very confused. The disciples were extremely confused, right? But we don't have to be confused. We can actually know. We can actually learn from even their mistakes, right? And go, oh, this is what he means by that. Now, from our text, I'm going to draw some of these conclusions. You ready? From our text, John 17, 20 and 21, verse 20 and 21. If you have your Bibles open, uh, I think it's going to be on the screen. But uh, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be what? One, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. Do you see the diversity there? And how 
how the Lord wants all of them that will come to be what? One. Does anybody see it? Now, I love, I love Paul. If you've been here at all, you know that, that I'm a huge Paul fan. So listen to Paul's words. And Dan, if you're watching, here's some of the things that I was talking about. So here's, here's Paul's thinking here. Galatians 3, 25 through 29. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For, and that they're, Paul's talking about the law. Um, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't. A few verses before this, this is the passage where he says that the law is our schoolmaster. Right? The law was the Ten Commandments and the other however many hundred commandments that are in the Old Testament. Those were to lead us to Jesus. But now that we are under Jesus, we are no longer under the law, but under grace. Right? This is kind of what Paul is saying. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Now, we're talking about a baptism into, we're talking about conversion, right? Not necessarily a water baptism. A water baptism would be evidence of this, but baptizing into Christ, uh, similar a sign of circumcision. We are now into the body of Christ. We are in the family of God. We have put on the coat. Uh, when the prodigal son came home, what happened? The, the father clothed him. He put on his coat, put on his ring, I believe. Um, it was a sign that he was a part of the family. He now had a place at the what? At the table. We put on Christ's what? Righteousness. We are to put off the old man and put on the new man. As the prodigal comes home, he is reinstated. We were lost, dead in our trespasses and sin, and when we are converted, when we are found, when we are delivered from the old man, we are to put on Jesus' righteousness. We are to become a part of the family. He is then our older brother in this scenario as it pertains to the father. And how interesting in that passage that the older brother is the problem. That's another conversation for another day. But we see here in Paul's framework, we're baptized and clothed into Christ. All of us are. Watch this. Verse 28. This is so good. There is no Jew or Greek. Slave, is, am I in King James? Oh, okay, all right. I didn't see if I uh, pasted in CSB or KJB here. This is CSB. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Huh. And this is where I'm not going to get too crazy into it. I might show my cards a little bit, but um, how do you discern there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female? I mean, is there any other way of putting it to say everyone is equal in this framework of the gospel? Do you see that? And, and this is where, you know, the idea of Israel and people that, because of their national status, they are uh, protected. And I think that this is where some people take certain parts of the Bible and they uh, elevate them. Def this definitely happened in my, former, um, in my former arena of independent Baptists. Everything was about Israel. When Paul was working really hard to say, hey, it's neither what, Jew or Greek. There, there is this idea that we are now one body in Christ. We are all together. And then and I think this is like a step further. And this is why uh, people that struggle with the Bible and some of the things that are cultural, the Bible was way ahead of its time. For him to say, for Paul to say, neither male nor female, do you understand that that is anti its present day culture? A woman would have been what? below. She would have been a lesser class. And Paul says, look, you, first of all, Peter in the church, you're trying to tell these folks that they need to be circumcised. You're trying to make Gentiles Jews. And Paul was like, I don't care. I'll send, I'll send a guy that's circumcised into a group of Jews to reach them, but I'll send a guy who's not circumcised to reach the Gentiles. 
I became all things to all men that I might by all means save some, Paul says. Way ahead of his time. Paul had women that were in ministry that were working for him. Phoebe, she was the one who read the letter uh, to the church at Rome. Delivered it personally, read it publicly, and if he's teaching and saying, look, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile in here in the body of Christ, we're all what? One. That is way ahead of its time. That's like where we are now, where we're trying to figure this thing out of equality and everybody, look, being on the same. It doesn't matter what race you are. We are all uh, the same. The Lord loves us all the same, even male and female. There are still people living in that construct where men think they're better than women. Lord Jesus, I mean, what, where is that? Where is it from? There are social constructs that we submit to because that's just how we were raised. It doesn't mean that they're right. And it, and it actually, the gospel is the opposite. Do you see it? I guess you don't see it. Y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> If you belong to Christ, then you are of Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. There is an element here that Jesus fulfilled what Moses could not. Jesus fulfilled in the church what Abraham could not fulfill in his own nation. Israel was the vehicle that brought Jesus to us, correct? Yeah. But it is the church that this vehicle will land in. That is his plan. That is the global goal. It is the church. Colossians 3, 9 through 17. Verse number 9. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices. And having put on the new self, you are being renewed. This is a whole other passage, right? Colossians. Think about what we've already said. And then here we are here in Colossians. And having put on the new self, you are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ... There is not Greek or Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in what? All. The Bible was way ahead of its time. Even in the midst of slavery, in Christ, there is no slavery. Do you understand that the gospel is the answer for every problem that we have on the earth? It is the answer. Long before America is the answer, it was the Bible. It's the gospel. It's who Jesus is. I love our country. We live in the greatest country on the face of this planet. The greatest. I'm absolutely pro-American. I love our country, right? But our country isn't the answer for our spiritual problem. Jesus is. And in fact, our country will bring more division, right, as politics are doing what politics do and what politicians do, right? Dividing us and creating sides, right? That, I mean, that's what Jesus does too, right? Yeah, they that are in Christ are of two parties. <laughs> this is great. One's red over here and one's blue over here. And this is how we do it. We debate each other. This is how it is in the body of Christ. You know what? That's how it is in most denominations. This is why I can't stand denominations. This is why I ended up starting a church, because I don't play nice with other people like that. I just don't. Look, we have to come to the conclusion that the church is the answer, Jesus is the answer, not this American political system. And we can't be, it's one or the other. And I understand, like, here's the thing, it's like, How do we, and I'm not saying I have this figured out. I'm just kind of like, we're just walking through this together, right? I can just, are we just having a conversation? Everybody okay? Just having a conversation, working it out here and on the internet. Here we are. Here we are just working it out. I'm not saying, I don't have this thing figured out. But I have to understand that the first thing that matters in my life, first place goes to the body of Christ. If I'm going to read Paul and Jesus says, in Christ there's neither Greek or Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. Watch this. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion. 
kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has grievances among you or against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also are to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, in everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Does that sound like most of our churches? Does that sound like you? Oh, yeah. Does that sound like your Facebook feed? Oh, yeah, pastor, of course. This is right there. Wait, wait. Compassion and kindness and humility. Yes. Gentleness and patience. <laughs> it's all there. Gives me all the warm and fuzzies. Yeah, that's what it is. Look, we are still divided. We are still a hot mess. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we're like, <laughs> some of you dudes still think you're better than women. What is wrong with you? Man, it is 2024. Well, I'm not a part of that feminist crap. Why are you letting feminism hijack what the scripture says? Why are you scared? Why, why are you scared to do something just because it's the hot button topic of the day? No, let's just be people of the Bible. I don't have to be drug into a construct so that I can survive in this construct and have people like me and love me. No, no, no. I'm in the body of Christ where we're all supposed to love each other, where we're all supposed to get along, even when we have different perspectives, even when we have different upbringings. This is what Christ prayed over us for. And if we can't get this right, what are we doing? I don't know what I'm doing here, Pastor. I think I'm going to leave. <laughs> No, that's not the point. The point is to change. The point is to be like this. It's hard, isn't it? Gosh, it's hard. Why was Paul so smart? Man, this guy used to kill Christians. Paul was the dude to say, if you're not a Jew, guess what? I'm slitting your throat. And he probably wasn't even the one that slit the throat. He probably had somebody do it with it for him. He was holding the coats of those that stoned Stephen. This guy made a complete 180. He didn't always believe that. There was a time in Paul's life where he believed that he was better than everyone around him. What is that evidence of? It's evidence that we can all change. It's evidence that the Lord is so good and that he loves us all dearly and that no matter where we come from or what our background is, he has a place at the table for us. And it's not about your righteousness. Paul's very clear, it's about Jesus' righteousness. I think we're putting on the wrong coat. I think we're trying to put on our righteousness. I think we're trying to look good at the table. I think we're trying to define how much better we are than everybody else when the gospel clothes us all the same. When the gospel wants us all to just say, hey, uh, you know how Jesus was always talking about how the Father was calling the shots? You know how the Holy Spirit doesn't call the shots. He says, well, I just kind of do what Jesus wants me to do. Let's take a note from the Trinity and go, it ain't about my, I just want to kind of do what Jesus wants me to do. I don't really have any good in me. What good I have or what good you see is him working through me. That's how we can all sit at the same table. You know, and when I say all this, it's like, it's so, it's, it's so simple, right? If there is a place in your heart that is upset or that has malice or that thinks you're better than anybody else, it's really simple. Just repent. Confess that. Repent it to the Lord. Change. And actually change and be different. If you have some of those feelings towards people, it's natural because of your sin, but it doesn't mean it's right. You can change. If Paul can change, so can we. All right. Now, consider your position in the church because of the gospel. Now, John said, we might end up going to two weeks with this. Uh, John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life. Uh, yeah, mm, it's not looking good, y'all. <laughs> Got 
a lot of notes left. Woo-hoo. Consider your position in the church because of the gospel. John 17, 3, watch this. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent me, Jesus Christ. Now listen to these words here. Eternal life is intimately connected. This is very important. Eternal life is intimately connected to your knowledge, and in this context, your relationship with the Father. To have eternal life is to know and be of the Father. Before your conversion, you are in rebellion or in your sin. And in that state, you don't have the capacity for eternal life when you are living in the temporal realm under the forces of darkness. These are the forces of darkness that Jesus defeated so that we may know the Father and be glorified in the Son, Jesus Christ. Do you see the the dichotomy is if I don't know Jesus, then I am a temporal being. If I have no connection to the Father who is eternal, then I am not eternal. Then I am not, my eternity is not secure. But if I am in the eternal Father, then my eternity is what? Secure. It's very simple, but this is what Jesus is saying. This is eternal life that you may know the only true God. Now, when I was pondering the, our church, uh, the, the church plant and the start, it's been eight years, right? Eight years ago, I came up with three things that I want our church to be marked by, and they are found here on our church website. So this is directly what I'm going to read to you this morning is directly cut and pasted from our church website. The first thing is knowing. Knowing. We believe that Jesus is the incarnate word of God. Through faithful study and exposition of the Bible, we learn more about his person. Our starting point in all matters is the knowledge of Jesus. We can understand other matters of of life as Jesus is revealed to us. Philippians 3.10, Paul said it this way. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. And we know that to know Jesus is to get to know the who? The Father. Why? Because that's what Jesus prays over us. And he says, listen, I'm connected to the the Father. The Father is the source of eternal life. And I am your connection to that, so get connected to me. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Pick up your cross and what? Follow me. The first step is knowing. Knowing. The second step from our website is serving. We believe a true knowledge of Christ leads to passionate service for Christ. God equips us all differently, but calls us all to action within the body. God's plan for the gospel is through the church. And it is through the faithful service of each member that this plan is accomplished. We recognize all the roles of service as essential and important. Colossians (laughs) 3.24. Knowing that you will receive the reward of your inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Huh. Now I've gotten to know Jesus. I'm connected to eternity. I'm no longer temporal. I'm not going to live for the things of this world. I'm going to live for what? Eternity. We say all these things that are so cliche, but this makes total sense. Why do people fall into sin? Because they're living in the temporal rather than the eternal. How do we live in the eternal? We get to know God. We engage in an eternal relationship. You're like, I'm living my life now. No, when you pray, you are engaging with someone outside of time. Someone who has control over everything. Someone who is not bound by your constructs of the alarm clock. How many are late this morning because they set the calculator? Anybody? (laughs) I feel like you needed a joke. Come on back. Knowing. Jesus says, eternal life, Father, I'm glorifying you. If they only understood that eternal life was knowing you. It's so simple, but it's so profound. And how many of us even talked to the Father this week? How many of us even prayed? Point number three, knowing, serving, praying. 
What Jesus is doing in the entire chapter of 17 is praying for himself and praying over his disciples. And and we take a page from his book and we have it right here on our website. We believe that we exist for God's pleasure and purposes. Our mission is clear. It begins with knowing Jesus from the scriptures, serving Jesus through the spirit, and leading us through prayer to our heavenly father for his purpose in our lives. Praying is the most intimate act that we have in our relationship with God. It serves as our connection to God, which is made possible by our champion, Jesus Christ. Colossians 4, 2 through 4, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us that our God may open a door for us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Let's move quickly through these last few points and texts here. John 17, 8. In our text, it says this. Because I have given them the words you gave me, they have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. Then you are God's. If you have believed, we go back to our two weeks on conversion. John 17, verse number nine. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. Now, here are some takeaways. Are you ready for something practical this morning? Look, I've I've given you my heart. I've told you. Look, we we gotta get to know. This is about knowing. It leads us to serving. The Lord gave them, He commissioned them for for literal service in, in His church. And then prayer is is just a constant communing thing that we're seeing, and we're seeing the Lord Jesus do it here. Here's some helpful takeaways from the message. As Christians, I love this, as Christians, number one, we can experience joy. As Christians, we can experience joy. Where's that, Pastor? Well, look at verse 13 in our text. John 17, verse 13. Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may, what? So that they may have my joy completed in them. Hey, I just, man, I feel like as Christians sometimes we get discouraged, and we forget that the war has been won. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're working against, do you understand that Jesus, the the incredible prayer that we just read this morning from chapter 17 from our Lord Jesus is right before he is betrayed and goes to the cross? (laughs) How are you going to pray that? And he knows it. How? Because he's intimately connected to something eternal. Are you not having joy? Are you miserable? Are you struggling? Maybe this morning as I talk about knowing God and serving, and you're like, man, I don't know know why I can't get out there and get something done for God. I'm just going to have to sit here and settle for church service once a week. No, 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 no. You can engage in this relationship. You can get to know him. You can pick up the word of God and dive in and get to know God in a way that opens up joy. Literal happiness, literal fulfillment in the midst of your trials. Jesus said this in his prayer in verse verse, uh, 13. I'm coming to you that they may have my joy completed in them. Whatever you think is going to make you happy, whatever you're living for, whatever purchase that you're about to make, I'm going to help you with something. It ain't going to do it for you. He's the only one that can eternally do it for you. Number one, practical helps from Jesus' prayer here. As a Christian, we can experience joy. Number two, as a Christian, we can experience protection against the forces of darkness. Did anybody read this in that passage? He said this in verse 15. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. How many are thankful that the Lord Jesus can protect us this morning? How many think that you're a sitting duck right now and you're like, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm just tanking on arrow after arrow. I feel like the Lord's coming at me. I feel like I can't get a win. Hey, guess what? You can pray for protection this morning. That's totally fine. Jesus prayed for it for you. How many are taking advantage of that for you and your children and your families? Look, you ought to know this morning, in Jesus' prayer, you can have joy. Come on, somebody say amen. Somebody, somebody do a little dance. No, I'm just kidding. 
Praise. Praise the Lord. Why? Because we can have joy in the midst of sorrow. Number two, you can have protection. That's all we need. The evil one's coming, but no, they're not going to get to you. Only what the Lord allows. And he's with you. Number three, as Christians, we can experience the truth. These are just reminders this morning. Look at verse 17 in our text. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is what? Truth. In a world of deception, we are to be set apart. Do you know that that's what the word sanctify means? It means to be set apart. What sets you apart? Lord Jesus, pray over me. Lord Jesus, I want, I want this chapter 17 for my life. I want pray over me. Well, I want to pray that you're set apart by the truth of the word of God. Um, wait a minute. I'm a good singer. I'm real fashionable. I'm a hard worker. How would you describe yourself? What sets you apart? Right? Here, here's what should be like on the tip of our tongue. When somebody says, what's unique about you? Well, I love the word of God. In fact, it's what sets me apart. I follow it. I read it every morning. I pray in it. The Lord leads me in that. Does that sound so foreign to you? If it sounds foreign, know this. According to Jesus' prayer, it doesn't have to. In fact, he wants to set you apart by his words. Think about your words this week. What'd you say? What set you apart? You're like, well, I said this. What was that? What'd you say? Let's scroll through your text messages real quick. What set you apart? Oh, that was a good one. That was a zinger. What sets you apart shouldn't be your ability to form words. It should be his ability in you through his word. Hey, his word. What do I see in Jesus' prayer? I see that Christians can experience the truth. The fourth and final. As Christians, we can experience making disciples. What? Me? Well, no. There's a slight progression here in his prayer, right? If you're being set apart by the truth, then let me tell you something. You're going to be making disciples. When was the last time the Lord used you to tell somebody about himself? Huh? When was the last time? It's getting quiet in here. Well, that's just not my gifting, Pastor. It's not your gifting. Really? According to his prayer, he's given it to us what? All. And he wants us to connect him to everyone else because he's going away. So you, you've been called to make disciples. You see, at some point, you're going to have to realize that all these things we've talked about today are important. And that it's actually been, that responsibility has been given to you. Listen, who are you keeping out of hell? Do you even believe there's a hell? Do you believe that there's an enemy that's working overtime? Do you believe that there's an enemy that's working hard to destroy the name of Jesus? What are you doing to contribute to the name of Jesus? Who have you told? Who are you working through? This is, it's a tough thing, right? You're like, I don't think I could lead anybody to Jesus right now. I can barely get myself to Jesus. We've all been there. And let me, let me help you with something. It's okay. It's okay. And it's not okay because of what you've done. It's okay because of what he's done. He knows where you are. He's done the work. And at any point in time, guess what? You can start down the journey again to getting to know who the Father is through Jesus Christ the Son. This is amazing how it works. It's called the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. These are the things that we need to ponder according to the prayers that Jesus has given us. Are you in the process this morning of knowing, serving, and praying? If not, then you are probably not leading others to do the same. The enemy church has been defeated. Jesus has called us to go, 
and tell those that are under the enemy's authority that they no longer have to stay there. They can be introduced to something and someone eternal rather than simply temporal living. We empty hell by growing in our relationship with Almighty God. I'm going to say that again. We empty hell by growing in our, return, in, in our eternal relationship with Almighty God.